Okay, hello and welcome to another lecture of EE102. So we're going to start with uh, some brief announcements. Once again, you have the syllabus online. If you have any CCLE difficulties, you have the help link here. And every week I send my office hour minutes. New to this announcement is the second homework is due Friday, April 17th at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. So once again, the homeworks are due every Friday for this class except for weeks where we have uh, an exam or the first week of class. So every week from here on, we'll have a homework assignment due unless there is an exam in that week. Okay, so last time we briefly talked about systems. So we very briefly spoke about systems. And remember that a system is, um, you know, a mathematical construct that operates on an input signal x of t. So a system does something to signals. Okay. And a system in the kind of uh, notation of this class, we will consider them as functions. Uh, functions whose inputs and outputs are signals of their own. So for example, if I have s of x of t, what the system is doing is it's taking as input what's in these outer parentheses. Okay, just as a quick note, side note, in general, in math, we won't always do it in this class, but if you're writing a manuscript for publication or writing something super official, then you might go S bracket X of T, you would just nest the parentheses. It can kind of get kind of confusing if you use parentheses like I did on the left-hand side here. So just, you know, in terms of mathematical style, see if you want to use uh, brackets. So for example, if I have a third operation, let's say I have another system applying, I might use a brace here. That way it's really clear uh, what the delineations are. Now, I don't always have good hygiene while writing out in a lecture, so good mathematical hygiene. So, um, you know, just watch out for this and perhaps you guys will do better than me and you guys can use braces and brackets and get really used to them, okay? All right, so, Systems uh, take as input a signal and then output another signal. And why that's really useful is because this allows us to actually process the signal and, and do stuff to it. In this class, we are mostly interested with SISO systems, single out input, single output systems. An example of this is shown uh, above here. Right? This would be a single input, single output. We're taking one input, which is X, and then outputting y. Okay, now remember we talked about signals and how signals can have properties, like you can have an even signal or you could have an odd signal. Likewise, systems can also have properties of their own. Uh, let's just run through some properties. The first property that we'll discuss is stability. Is my system stable? So a stable system is a system that can take a bounded input and yield a bounded output. So here's a concrete example. Okay. Let's say I have some x of t and the absolute value of x of t, so for all t, the, so let me write this a little neater. So for all t, remember that this symbol here means for all. So for all t, the absolute value of x of t is less than infinity. So it takes on some you know, value. So so it's bounded, right? So the input is bounded. So here's the input and the input is bounded. Now, uh, for this input, uh, in this particular case, we apply our system and we get an output. So here's our system, it applies to X and it spits out Y. So now Y is also bounded. So in this case, the system is stable because X is bounded, Y is bounded. Now, where this could be a problem is, let's just pretend that I have a very simple signal like x of t equals, you know, zero, let's just make it discrete, zero, three, one, and it goes to my system s and then it spits out a y, right? And it spits out a y, and that y equals infinity, in, you know, infinity, infinity. In this particular case, this system is unstable, right? It's mapped my inputs to infinity and you know, I've lost any type of 
uh, meaning to that system. Okay, the second property that we'll discuss is causality. So a system is causal if its output only depends on past and present values of the input. So for example, if I have a y of t, I can say that a system is causal if y of t depends only on terms like you know, x of t, x of t minus one, et cetera. So this is a causal system. In this particular case, uh, a system that is causal uh, basically depends on the memory, right? The previous stuff that came before. A system that is non-causal, right? Or uh, doesn't have this causality property could start to depend on future terms of the input, okay? And that would not be a system that obeys causality. Another property that we'll discuss is time invariance. A time invariant system, and this is a very important property. The other two properties that we discussed are also important, but this property has very important practical applications. Okay, a system is time invariant if a time shift in the input only produces an identical time shift of the output. Okay, what this means mathematically is that a system is time invariant if I have some y of t, remember y of t is always the output of, my, of, our, of our system. Okay, so y of t is always the output of our system. And in this particular case, if this holds, right, this is just my standard equation, right? This is my standard equation saying I have x, it goes into some system s, that uh, gives me y. So this standard equation uh, gives you this formula. Now, if this formula holds, the second part of the clause is what's in this square bracket, right? This is the very important part. Y of t minus tau equals s of x t minus tau. Okay? This holds for all tau. Now, what does this mean? Intuitively, this is saying that if we shift the input in time, we shift the output by that same amount. Okay, shift the input, shift the output. So we can draw this graphically. Okay, we can draw this graphically here. I'm going to draw a few systems. So for example, I have x of t. It goes in to some sort of delay buffer. So delay tau. Okay, now after it's been delayed by tau, this gives me x of t minus tau. Now this goes into my system s and it gives me an output. Okay. Likewise, I can have x of t going directly into my system. And now this gives me y of t. Let me actually draw this with a different color, pardon me. So I have x of t goes into s, gives me a y of t. This y of t gets now delayed. And this gives you y of t minus tau. And now the key idea is that both of these are equal to y of t minus tau. So this is also equal to y minus t of tau. So if I shift the input, I shift the output. These two things are equivalent. Where this becomes interesting in an application context, so let me write out here, oops. Application context. So let's pretend that we are in, I don't know, I'm just gonna give you a, an example. Um, 
there was historically there was this um um I hate to bring up a war example, right? War is never a fun thing. But in World War II, there were a lot of advances made to radar systems so that people could detect these bombers that were potentially coming in and harming civilian targets. So you might have this bomber that's coming in uh, and your radar system might not be strong enough to detect uh, the signature of a stealth bomber, right? Or uh, in World War II. So you have this, this plane that comes in and this is your plane. Okay, so here's your, your plane. It comes in and it's being detected by some sort of uh, radar, which gives you an X of T. So this is the signal that I get off the radar. But X of T is very weak. So I need to have a system, a signal processing system S that goes and boosts X of T like an amplifier. So for example, if I had a signal like this with a little tiny blip there, S might go and give me a nice amplification to that. Okay. So in this particular case, uh, we know that if the signal has a strength that is somewhat like this, so here's the strength of the signal. If the signal has this strength, we know that it should always be boosted let's say that this height of the signal is about, let's say, one unit. Now it's boosted to about, well, let's, you know, three units. And this unit could be voltage. And three units is strong enough to sense that as a uh, potential uh, enemy target coming in. So we had one unit and we went up to three units by boosting the signal with a system. Now we've boosted the signal with the system, uh, but we also want to make sure that our system is time invariant. So what would happen is that if this plane, we don't know when this plane, plane is going to come. We don't know when. So let's say this plane comes back tomorrow, uh, the same exact plane, and it has the same exact one unit signature tomorrow, right? We don't want the system to go and output uh, you know, two units the next day or half a unit the next day. We want it to be stable in the sense of any time that it comes in, I'm going to have the same boost that's being applied to the radar signature. So um, this property of time invariance doesn't always hold for systems. It's a very desirable property, but doesn't always hold. So for example, if my radar system uh, performs differently in temperature, right? let's say on hot days, it has a different boost than on cold days, then this would not be a time invariant system conceptually. So ideally, when we design systems, we try to make them time invariant so that we can extract meaning from them. As we'll see later in this lecture, if the system is time invariant, if that also pairs with a nice property called linearity to give us very powerful mathematical tools. So you'll see that many sensors in the world, whether it's cameras or microphones or the like, are designed in context of having both linearity and time invariance in the hardware, which enables us to do amazing things as we'll discuss in this class in the software. Okay, so now let's go through some examples of time invariance from a more mathematical perspective. So this would be like kind of mathy. Right, the last slide about the radar was just conceptual. So let's start with an example. Let's say we have a function that is a square, right? I have a, I have a system that is called the square system. The square -er system. And what the square -er does is the following. It takes a y of t, and y of t is gonna equal nothing but, I'll try to use the bracket here, x of t squared, okay? So in this particular case, as a you know, question that we might ask is regarding the input and output, if the delayed input equals the delayed output. So the question that you might be asked either on a homework or an exam would be, is the system, is the square, Is the square a time invariant system? And the answer conceptually is yes, right? Because you're squaring x of t, it doesn't matter what time x of t comes in, whatever value x of t has, regardless of what time that occurs, it's always going to be square. So 
conceptually, it may seem simple, but it is worth going through it because in more complicated examples, we may not have that intuition. So the way that you would analytically show that this is time invariant is the first thing you would do is you would delay the input. So let's suppose that the input is delayed. So let's suppose that uh, we instead take x of t, put it through a delay, and then put it into our system s to give you an output. Right. So written in block diagram, let me just draw these blocks to make it more clear. I'm going to have a, a delay by some tau. Then I'm going to have an application of s. And this is going to give me essentially the output. So let's write out the output. Okay. So the output in this particular case is going to be if I delay by tau, right, the delay by tau is going to give me x of t minus tau, right, that's a delay by tau. So I'm right about here, right, this is where I am. And then I'm going to apply the system, which is taking x of t minus tau, and then squaring that, okay. So the output is going to be x of t minus tau squared. Now, what would happen if I delayed the output? So for example, Let's say that I have y of t minus tau, right? And I delay that. Well, y of t minus tau, if I look at the original system right here, right, right here, if I plug in t minus tau for t, that gives me x of t minus tau squared. Okay. So now, whether I delay the input or I delay the output, these two are equal. Therefore, and these three dots mean therefore, therefore, system is time invariant. Okay. Let's uh, take a look at another example. And this can be a check your understanding, right? So check your understanding. Here's an actual example from AM radio. So in AM radio, what we have is we have a signal y of t that you know you might measure at your car or wherever. And this is going to equal the original signal that you want to have the information, like the music, x of t. But x of t is in the amplitude modulation of a sinusoid. x of t times cosine of omega c t. Okay. In this case, omega c is the carrier wave. So the amplitude of the carrier wave is changing over time. And that change in the amplitude is actually a signal that we want to measure. And that signal is actually our music. And this is AM radio, how it works in our car. So now the question to check your understanding, is AM radio time invariant? So why don't you go ahead and uh, give it a try and see if you can calculate if AM radio is indeed time invariant. So feel free to pause the video and rejoin us in a moment. Okay, welcome back. So AM radio, how do we see if this is time invariant? To be honest, if I look at this form of the equation, if I simply look at the form of the equation, it is hard for me to tell if this equation is time invariant just looking at it, right? It's a little bit more complicated than the squaring example. So I would, if it were me, just simply go through the derivation. So I would first delay the input okay, in the same exact way. So let's first take x of t, let's delay it, and then let's put it into the system. So if I do that, I'm going to get an output is calculated as x of 
t minus tau, t minus tau, okay, times cosine of omega c t. Right, what the system is doing is it's taking some signal x and multiplying it by a cosine. So in this particular case, it should be clear that I'm going to delay the signal x, but the cosine uh, of the carrier wave is not delayed, right? That's what this means. Now, by contrast, uh, if we delay the output directly, then the output is calculated now. as y of t minus tau, right? y of t minus tau equals x of t minus tau. I'm just plugging in right here into this equation. So it equals x of t minus tau times cosine of omega c. And again, I'm just plugging in here t minus tau. So in this particular case, uh, the signal if I it is not time invariant, right? Because I sh if I shift the input, I don't shift the out output by the same amount. You can see that by going through these calculations and seeing that they're not equal. Therefore, this is not time invariant. Okay. So maybe we can go through one last example. Again, you know, check your understanding. We'll do this one together. You don't need to pause the video. Just try to think of it in your head. So you have y of t, the output, is going to equal t times x of t. Okay. So just take a moment and look at this equation. Now, if I ask you the question on a homework or exam, is this time invariant? What would you think, right? Uh, intuitively, you can kind of see that the answer is probably no, right? Because if I delay x of t, then the scaling factor changes. If you look at that radar example that we were talking about earlier, if the plane comes in later, it's going to get multiplied by a different scaling factor than if the plane were to come in earlier. So you can clearly see that this is probably not going to be time invariant. And so you can conceptually just do this, okay? You can conceptually do this by taking x of t and delay this input, right? So first I delay the input as I have been doing previously. Let me use the same color, please excuse me. I was using this uh, orange color. So I'm gonna delay the input, okay? So if I delay the input, the output I'm going to get is equal to t times x of t minus tau, right? By contrast, if I go ahead and uh, delay the output, then we're going to see that this is going to equal y of t minus tau multiplied by t minus tau times x of t minus tau. And these two are not equal. Therefore, this is not time invariant. Okay, So this is an example of how you can calculate time invariance. If you're given the mathematical form of a system, it is fairly straightforward to show whether it is time invariant or not. OK. Now, let us move on to the next property, which is linearity. A system is linear if the following two properties hold. The first property is homogeneity. Okay. So homogeneity is uh, the, a sub-property of a system. It says that for any signal x and any scalar a, s of ax equals a s of x. Okay. So if y were to equal 
S of X, as we have been doing in this class. Remember, X goes in. This is our canonical system. It goes into S and outputs Y. That's typically what a system is. So in this case, that's equivalent to saying Y equals S of X, as I've written here. So Y equals S of X. Therefore, this equality can also be written as a Y, if you wanted to write it that way. So if we were to take a look at what the block diagram looks like, we have, um, once again, x going in to a system to give you y. And if I scale that, I can take ax. So let's use blue to show you that this is the homogeneity property. So if I have ax, this goes in to the system s to give you a y. All right. So this is an example of the homogeneity property. Now we have another property that we are interested in called superposition. Okay. Superposition says that for any two signals, x and uh, x tilde, so this x tilde just means it's a different signal, so it's just distinct from x, then it says that I can superimpose or a fancy word for just adding them, right? So I can either add the inputs, so this is here adding two inputs, and applying s and here we have apply on the right hand side we have applying s first and adding the outputs so s is being applied separately to x and x tilde so uh, a system should satisfy superposition if this equality holds. Now, this is hopefully very intuitive uh, what this is saying, right? Many, many systems are going to have superposition. So for example, whether it's the radar signal right coming in, uh, if I take the radar signal and then I amplify each plane and then I amp add the amplifications, or if I first add the two planes together, the signal from the two planes, and then I amplify it, I should ideally get the same result. So uh, these systems are very common. Systems that satisfy both one and two are known as linear systems. Okay, linear a linear system must satisfy both properties one and two. Now we can say that a system is linear. One way to check if a system is linear is to apply both homogeneity and property. Uh, and superposition simultaneously is to see if this, equ this equation holds, right? I have S of some constant a x plus let's say a x plus bx tilde, and this equals a times s of x plus b times s of x tilde. So you can see that we can check if a system is linear if we apply both the homogeneity and superposition properties simultaneously with this one equation. So if this one equation holds, you don't need to go and separately check homogeneity and superposition together. Okay. Great, moving on. We can start by looking at some of the basic systems that we looked at, like the AM radio and the square and seeing if they are indeed linear systems, right? Previously, we checked that they were time invariant, that they satisfy time invariance. Now, let us check if they satisfy linearity. So let me start again with AM radio. So we had AM radio. So AM radio means amplitude modulated radio. And you have Y of T 
equals x of t times the cosine of omega c t, right? Omega c is the carrier wave frequency. And this is a system. And I'm going to write the system in capital letters. I'm going to write this actually as just am, OK? Am of x of t. So instead of writing s of x of t, like we have usually done for a system, this is a specific system for am radio. So I'm just going to write it as capital AM, right? So if I look at the AM system, the goal is to, sh to prove linearity. So the goal, so the check your understanding question is, is the AM system linear? Is AM radio linear? That's the check your understanding question. And so the goal that we have to show this is we have to first show that am of ax of t plus bx tilde of t is equal to A times AM of X of T plus B times AM of X tilde of T. Right. So that is our goal to show that this holds. So we can start by labeling this right here. This is the left hand side of the equation, and this is the right-hand side of the equation, right? Right of the equal sign and left of the equal sign. So let's break it down. And basically, we just need to show that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. So let me start with the left-hand side. So the left-hand side is essentially takes this form. A, x of t. plus b x tilde of t multiplied by cosine of omega c t. Okay. So that's the left-hand side of this equation. So you can see that by just looking at the definition of am and just doing the algebra. Now, if that's the left-hand side of the system, let's see how we can manipulate it to look more like the right-hand side. So to make this look more like the right-hand side, the first thing I would do is I noticed that the right-hand side has a summation of two system outputs. So I might go and write this uh, by applying the distributive property. So I'd write this as ax of t times cosine of omega ct plus bx of t in this case, bx tilde of t, multiplied by, once again, the cosine of omega ct. Now, if I look at this, if we just stare at this equation for a moment, so stare at this, let's see if we look at this equation, what does it look like? Well, this equation is nothing but the AM system's output. So if I look at the AM system here, right, this equation is nothing but, let's look at this first point here. This is the output if I put uh, essentially X of T into the AM system and then scaled it by A. So hopefully it's clear that this first part under the magenta bracket here is nothing but AM, so A times AM of X of T, right? So you can just see that if you just look at that magenta reference, because we have the equation for the system, and you can see that what's under the magenta bracket really uh, just maps over to the definition of the system. So in like fashion, if I look here, 
right? I can also look back at that same definition and I see that this is exactly like putting X tilde of T into the system, into AM, and then scaling that by some constant B. So I'm gonna end up with B times AM of X tilde of T, All right? So this is our system. And if I look here, this portion right here is actually equal to the right-hand side. And so therefore, the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. And the AM radio system is linear. This is an exclamation mark. So yes, the AM radio system is linear. Now, uh, we learned about another system, right? Another system that we looked at was the squarer. Okay. The squarer had the form of this. Y of t equals x of t squared. Right? Now, once again, what we want to do when we have the equation for the system is we want to show we want to show that s of ax of t plus bx tilde of t is going to equal a times s of x of t plus b times s of x tilde of t. Okay. So we want to show that this left hand side here equals this right hand side here. Okay. So in this particular case, uh, this is a check your understanding question. And I'm going to let you actually do this check your understanding question at home. So check your understanding, do this at home, and feel free to post on Piazza your answer, right? You want to say your answer, the question is, just to re recap the question, is the squarer a linear system, okay, at home? Okay, let's move on to one more example. I want to make it a little bit more complicated, so we'll do it together. So we'll put an integral sign here. So another system that you can potentially have is the integrator. And the integrator takes the form of y of t equals integral from minus infinity to t of x of tau d tau. So we talked about this uh, signal before briefly. And you'll notice once again that within the integral, the domain that we're integrating over is actually tau. Okay. So in this particular case, if we want to prove that the system is linear, we apply the exact same ideas that we've spoken about. So we want to show that S of AX of T plus BX tilde of T is equal to AS of X plus B S of X tilde of T, okay? okay? 
So once again, we have a left-hand side to the equation and we have a right-hand side to the equation. So we wanna show that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. So maybe we might start with the left-hand side. Okay, so the left-hand side is gonna be nothing but this integral, once again, minus infinity to t. Okay, minus infinity to t. And once again, I have ax of tau plus bx tilde of tau, right? And we were using red color for this. And I'm gonna integrate over d tau. And if I actually compute this integral, this is gonna equal a times the integral from minus infinity to t of x of t, I'm sorry, x of tau, we're integrating over the domain of tau, x of tau, d tau, plus, in this particular case, we'll have b here, times the integral from minus infinity to t, of x tilde of t, x tilde of tau, d tau. Okay. And so the left-hand side is gonna simplify to something like this. Now the right-hand side, let's take a look at the right-hand side. The right-hand side is gonna equal in blue here, a times the integral of minus infinity to t of x of tau d tau plus b integral from minus infinity to t of x tilde of tau d tau. And so you can see that in this particular case, the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. So the system is linear. 